Good morning, students, staff, and guests, and welcome to the 2018 Wall of Honor ceremony. Um, I've had the opportunity this morning to visit with several of the, actually, they really like to visit. I had to kick them out of breakfast to get in here uh, to get ready to go. Uh, you're, you're really in a treat, uh, up for a treat to learn, learn from some really interesting uh, individuals. Um, you know, during our class meetings, we talk about getting 1% better every day. And uh, these are people that have gotten 1% better every day. Um, you know, this is an opportunity. We talk about the high school. We're learning to learn. And um, these people are going to give some great information. And it's a great opportunity to learn here this morning. So with that being said, Mr. Courtright, FHS Activities Director, will now offer opening remarks about the Wall of Honor. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Alright. I too welcome the Wall of Honor inductees, their family members, and their friends back to FHS. Congratulations again on your deserving induction. This is an awesome assembly that allows us to honor some of Fairfield High School's great graduates. I always look forward to this assembly because every time we hold it, I become inspired by the inductee stories and I gain some valuable insight into what it takes to be great. Students, I hope you too have this experience during the assembly and I hope that you realize that each and every one of you have what it takes to someday be a Wall of Honor inductee. My job today is to give a little background about the Wall of Honor, so I guess I better do that. The Wall of Honor was established to recognize distinguished graduates of Fairfield High School. An organizational committee has been formed from school district administration and former FHS graduates. The Wall of Honor is funded through private donations. Anyone may nominate a graduate of Fairfield High School for this prestigious honor. Forms may be secured from the principal's office or from the district website and are due by June 1st of each year. In addition to being a graduate, living or deceased, a nominee must have one, achieved distinction in their profession, public career, and or community service, and two, had a positive influence on the lives of others. An engraved plaque with a picture, biography, and citation for each inductee will be on permanent display on the north wall of the Fairfield High School Commons. This display exemplifies the high quality of education available to Fairfield students and allows inductees to serve as role models for these students. For more information about the Wall of Honor, please visit the Fairfield Community School District website or contact the high school office. I now turn the mic back over to our outstanding principal, Mr. Brian Stone. Thank you, Mr. Gordon. Our first presenter this morning will be Mr. Dan Breen, who will be introducing Mr. Ron Hunterdos. Mr. Hunter Doss to some of you and Coach Hunter Doss to others, but those to most of us. Uh, we've been friends and colleagues and worked together on many things for 40 some years, so this is a, my chance to, to tell you a little bit about the man. These types of awards are generally centered around major achievements, uh, sometimes in the arts, sometimes in the military or business or sports. And DOSA certainly had several of those. The Trojan Honor Plaza, you're going to see a wonderful addition out front. He's played a big role. Wait till you see that next year, uh, the entrance to this auditorium. And many other things. But that's really not what it's about with, with DOSA. Uh, I want to explain why I really think he's here, why he's going to go on that wall that he so richly deserved. And it isn't necessarily the major thing. You've all been told that you should aspire to do great things. And I hope you do. And some of you will. But not everybody will. You may not have the talent or the good fortune or the opportunity. But I, I want to tell you what you can do. And you can follow the resume that DOS has. And I hope you all, you students out there, consider this. I was an educator all my life, so everything becomes a teachable moment. You may or may 
may not have the opportunity to do the major things, but you are going to have an opportunity to do the most important things. I want you to think about that. It's not, it's not going to be easy. It always sounds easy. Just do the right thing. But if it was easy, we all would be doing it. We would all have a lifetime of small achievements that added up to a, a grand life. But we all don't. So I want, I want to go over Dosen's real resume here. Starting with, how about treating people with dignity and humor? And do it every day. And do it with everybody, including the people who maybe don't have the popularity of the friends that some other people may have. But that would be dose. Acknowledge people. Kids, smile, nod, acknowledge everyone, not just the popular, not just the strong. Recognize and protect the weak, the people who needed a, maybe a little friend to help. That would be dose. Raise a great family so the communities which they live in will benefit for the lifetime of, of their service. And then I want you to think about this. You all have your community service that you are obligated to do. There's only one problem with that. That's a different kind of service if it's an obligation. Love and serve your community but do it joyfully. Do it quietly, not for credit. Do it spontaneously and do it for a lifetime. And when you do, this is what you end up with. You end up with a life well lived and you end up in the community, and I'm so proud of Fairfield as a whole, that this is what you're gonna recognize. A person who's done those things, lived that kind of life, and I hope you all would aspire to have the same kind of life. With that, my good friend and colleague, Mr. Ron. courage 
and determination that I'm actually walking this earth today, let alone up here talking to you. You see, my late oldest brother, Bill, was born with a birth defect that caused him to go blind at birth. Both of my parents had to carry this flawed, recessive gene in order for that to happen. The doctors, I'm sure, didn't know what they had on their hands when they saw the bone shifting in my brother's head. So they recommended that he be institutionalized. And of course, having more children, well, that was going to be a dangerous option. My parents rebuked the experts. They were determined to keep Bill at home and raise him there. And they were also determined to have more children. So in between older brother Bob and younger sister Janet, in 1950, Ronald Ivan was born. I lived my entire youth, from birth all the way through high school, in one location, 405 East Hempstead. Here's why I'm telling you that. You go out the back door to the band room, across the street and practice field, up the hill and about a half block to the west. That's my place. I remember a dirt floor basement. I remember a coal furnace and a bed that shook when the trains went by just to the north of our backyard. You can imagine that. I also remember that my dad used to give the three of us boys butch haircuts about every three or four months. And I know some of you out there are thinking, must have gouged that little fella a little bit, huh? I can assure you, all this happened quite naturally. My dad worked in a factory. My mom stayed home with the four of us kids. We weren't long on material things, but I didn't even notice. I was too busy enjoying my ginormous playground. That would be the high school grounds. Right back here behind the school, the lower practice field, where they do the shot put and the discus, that used to be the high school pond. That's where I learned to ice skate and hunt frogs with my slingshot. Then there were the hills for sledding and the fields themselves for things like kickball, baseball, football, golf, flying kites. And then over here to the west side of the school grounds, there were the upper and lower tennis courts with a couple of basketball hoops. And yes, Anada and Yana, I had a pretty good self-taught game of tennis at the time. Of course, we had Trojan Stadium and the gymnasium, which we snuck into on multiple occasions. Within a one block radius of this school grounds, there were three families. One had 13 kids, one had nine kids, and one had eight kids. It was all day recess, every day, and it was right there at my fingertips. I went to Washington Elementary. It was a two-story structure, it looked a lot like the one at the rec center. And that's where I developed my distance running skill, by running the half mile home for lunch, gobbling my lunch, and then running back so I could be one of the first ones on the playground for noon recess. I went to elementary school through seventh grade, then was on to the Pence building for junior high. It was there that I was introduced to interscholastic athletics. I played basketball and ran track, and I was hooked. So now it's on to high school, 10th through 12th grade. Uh, class sizes back in those days, in the late 60s and 70s, were easily 200 students or more. My life revolved around athletics, and it went something like this. Sophomore year, cross country, basketball, track, baseball. Junior year, do what I did the sophomore year. Senior year, do what I did the other two years. I was involved with other activities, but sports was my passion. Study? I didn't have time for that. I was too busy. And the fact of the matter, I didn't make time to study. I didn't have the self-discipline uh, to do what I needed to do. I was doing just enough to get by, unfortunately. I graduated in 1968. Now it's time to go to college. I wanted to get out of town to go to college, so I enrolled in a small school in Alberley, Minnesota. Uh, I wanted to pursue my baseball and basketball career, but I also started coming to the realization that I needed to figure out what I was going to do for the rest of my life after college. 
So I actually started to study. It was really hard at first. I had never spent that amount of time studying. I didn't know how to organize things. I didn't know how to make things important, how to filter some things out because they weren't important. But I was a quick study on it. I figured it out. I also figured out that it was not going to be financially sustainable for me to go to college away from home. So after one year, back to Fairfield I come. Thank goodness there was a four-year school right here in Fairfield, Parsons College. Honestly, had that not been there, I can't tell you with any certainty that I would have continued with my higher education. There was no real family history of that. But because I could stay at home and avoid the cost of room and board, and I had a part-time job at the local Hy-Vee store, all of a sudden college is a reality for me again. I graduated in my four years, and I did it with zero debt. Well, now it's time to get a job. This shouldn't be too hard. Among my awards in college, I was named the most outstanding physical education uh, student at Parsons College for the class of 1972. I'm a big deal. Well, evidently I'm the only one that got that memo. Because all the places I sent resumes to, I got zero interviews. Not a one. So I had to swallow my pride. There was a job opening right here in this school as a study hall supervisor. Not a teacher, a supervisor. So my first three years, my professional growth went like this. Half-time study hall, half-time physical education, and coaching three sports. Needless to say, I was getting a little discouraged with my professional growth. But on the other hand, there was an uptick in my social life. I met a cute young gal named Linda Book. She was a teacher at Pekin. We got married in 1976. The following year, that summer, I was offered a job as a Farm Bureau representative in Sigourney, Iowa. We even looked at housing. But I decided to turn down the job that probably would have altered my life forever. I decided to stay patient, come back home, wait for that full-time teaching job. I also decided to get my master's degree. So during the summers, I enrolled at Northeast Missouri State University, now known as Truman State, in Kirksville. I got my master's in physical education with an emphasis in sports administration. Now it's time to start a family. Linda and I were blessed with three children. Two girls, Carrie and Aaron, and son, Eric. Thank goodness they understood the importance of an education and the power of good study habits. They were all excellent National Honor Society students. Now they're out in the world making their contribution to society. It was also in 1986 that I finally got that full-time teaching position at the middle school. I met first-year teacher Nancy Ralston. That would be Mrs. Deers to most of you. But one of you has the privilege of calling her mom. We were a great fit. And I spent 22 years teaching physical education with Nancy until I retired in 2008. That would make you students approximately, if my math is correct, approximately eight, seven, and six, and five at that time. Well, that's my story in a nutshell. Now let me connect some dots for you. Remember we talk about I didn't have time to study, I lack the self-discipline to study? Huge mistake. Huge. Fortunately, I recovered from my error. The takeaway for you should be, it's not too late to start studying, even as a senior. It won't make any difference whether you're going to a four-year school for a profession or a two-year trade school. You're going to need those study habits and that self-discipline in order to be successful at the next level. Remember me saying I graduated from college with no debt? That's not realistic today. Don't let debt deter you from reaching your goals. And don't let anybody Nobody tells you that your goals are not attainable. You should be the primary decision maker 
on whether you can reach those goals. I think you'll know enough to adjust if you need to. Remember me saying I was disappointed and discouraged that I didn't get the job I thought I was going to get right out of college? In fact, it took me 14 years to get to the point where I thought I would be right away. Well, don't be too surprised or discouraged if that happens to you. Take the lesser job. Be patient and persistent. You will get rewarded for that. Lastly, get involved with your school. It is scientifically proven that those that connect to their high school through activities are more likely to succeed academically. You know, from my earliest memories as a child, it's been about the school and the land that surrounds it. Little did I know as a child, they would be responsible for my adult life as well. They hired me in 1972, renewed their subscription for 34 more years. My wife was educated here. Of course, my three kids were educated here. I actually feel like I owe this school for everything that it's given me. And that's why it's so hard for me to say no when I'm asked to give back. And I will continue to give back as long as my health allows me to. Now, as far as what this honor means to me, my wife and my children, I think they know. I think they know the magnitude of this moment for me. That's why my kids took uh, vacation days and personal days so they could bear witness to this moment. This school and this land surrounds it. It's sacred ground to me. The colors of orange and black, they run deep inside my body. So for me to be honored on that wall with all those great people at a school that's given me everything, it means I've come home. I've come home permanently to a place that I never ever left. Thank you for your patience. Go Trojans. Ms. Cindy Crawford will now introduce Dr. Polly Adam Brecky. Her students look up to Polly because she can relate to them. 
She's gone through what they deal with every day, with not being able to hear or needing to use an interpreter. They, Holly inspires them. And her staff, she's a guide. Holly is continually seeking the best practices for instructing those deaf students. The second thing I would like to say about Holly, or share, is her humanitarian side. In the fall of 2008, Polly's first husband, J.W., began to have problems breathing. Polly rushed him to the hospital, and that whole long night, Polly asked for an interpreter. Asked, repeatedly told, we're working on it. Can you imagine being in a foreign country and your most loved, prized individual, your life partner, is not able to breathe, and you can't understand what they're talking about, it's a different language. Well, I could understand that in a foreign country, but Polly and JW were not in a foreign country. They were in Des Moines, Iowa. There's a plethora of interpreters there. That's their home, and their home language should have been used, but they were denied that access. So in the early morning hours, William lost his battle and passed away. And not once was an interpreter provided so that Polly could have, and William as well, have that communication access to know what was really going on. But Polly being the person she is, humble and quiet and very shy, took it upon herself to not allow William's death to be in vain. And in 2011, she won a lawsuit against that hospital. Because really, under the ADA, they are required to provide interpreters, but they refused. But Polly didn't want another. It wasn't just for selfish reasons, but for other deaf and hard of hearing, she wanted to be sure they had that access if that should ever happen to one of their loved ones. Which then led to, in 2012, Polly was awarded the Iowa Association for Justice, Roxanne Conlin Public Justice Award. So even though it was a devastating occurrence for Polly, something we none of us would want to think about going through, she took a really devastating situation and made it good for others. The last thing I would like to say about Polly is that in May of 2017, she finished her doctorate degree, her PhD. Now, if you were to ask her about it, she will humbly say, it took me 10 years. But you know what? What people do not realize was the things that happened in Polly's life that just set her back, per se. But, however, encouragement of her family members and the nagging specifically of her father Ronald Adam Polly achieved her PhD thanks to Ron and then the love and the support of her husband Michael Recky and the confidence from many of her friends Polly accomplished her goal of earning her PhD so please welcome Dr. Polly Brecky recognized with this award. Thank you all so very much. It really is a daunting task for me to be here and to think about what I want to share with all of you about my life experiences. 
Because really, as I look back on my life, my experiences, I consider them equal to everyone else. I don't see anything special. But I do know that I am here and I have been nominated for a reason. So as I was thinking about the reasons as to why I would be here and what makes me different than anyone else, number one, I'm deaf. You can clearly see that. I sign, I have an interpreter, she's voicing for me today. I sign, I speak. I use beautiful ASL, but I also love English as well, and I've used that my whole life. So there are just different ways as I look back um, through my life, as far as things with my hearing loss. I have a threefold message for you. I'm a proud graduate of Fairfield High School, 1987. My dad graduated in 1958, and my brother graduated in 1991. My mom graduated, but it was from a different high school. The three of us, our family, all grew up here in Fairfield and graduated from Fairfield High School. I was born deaf but my parents did not know that until I was three years old and nine months. Back at that time, they didn't have the early hearing detection that they have today. So when my parents saw me, you know, how would they figure out if a child was deaf? I was a really quiet child, but I was a very happy child. They only, I only, but I only knew two words, hot and juice. That was it. And my parents thought, well, that's probably pretty common. And then they found out that I was deaf. In my family, though, my dad's family, I have over 62 first cousins. None of them are deaf. I have over 100 second cousins. None of them are deaf. And then on my mom's side of the family, I have 20 cousins. None of them are deaf. I'm the only one. So when my parents found out that I was deaf, they gave me what's called a body hearing aid. You have the, the ear molds in your ears and the cords to the box on your chest. So I grew up with that. And then I think it was in fifth grade, I finally got the on the ear hearing aids. I was so excited because back then I had this box with these straps and these cords. Everybody noticed it. So I was so excited when I finally got um, on the ear hearing aids. I went to Washington Elementary School through kindergarten through second grade. I didn't have any support back then, nothing. But the teacher and the other staff began to notice uh, I wasn't learning. I wasn't doing the same things that the other kids were doing and I was behind. But I didn't have any idea uh, that I was any different. But I do remember that I would sit at my desk and I would constantly watch my neighbor. And whatever they wrote or whatever they did, I would copy it. I would just copy what they were doing because I had no idea what I was supposed to write or what I was supposed to do. So I would copy other people's work. That year in second grade, it just so happened the principal and um, it was Mr. Dooley at that time and my teacher, Mrs. Olin. The two of them um, started a discussion with my parents about perhaps sending me to a different program um, that had deaf education services. Because it just so happened at that time, um, they passed the law that was a special ed law, um, the IDEA. It was a Dis I Disabilities Act. So the school districts were then required to, pre to provide free and appropriate public education the same as everybody else. And so that happened when I was in second grade and they had set a program up in another district. So I had to go um, to Agassiz Elementary and that was in Ottumwa, Iowa for third through, third through fourth, fifth grade. Yes, third, fourth, and fifth. Now they had a teacher for the deaf and her, her name was Mrs. Olson, and she would sign for me. Then I also had another teacher um, that taught a general ed class, but she decided for herself 
that she would learn to sign. So I was in her classroom. Her name was Shirley Lockie. And she taught and signed and spoke all at the same time. There was one other deaf student in the class with me, so it was wonderful because I felt like I fit in and I had that feeling of belonging with the class. Some of the hearing kids there learned to sign as well. So I also had friends. Then that was time for me to go to junior high. So I stayed um, in Ottawa um, through junior high, seventh and eighth grade there. And I had a sign language interpreter for my classes in seventh and eighth grade. She was there all day. Now in ninth grade, um, my parents wanted me to come back here to Fairfield because um, this is my home and they wanted me to be close to home. And I knew that um, at Tumwa High School, um, I really didn't want to attend school there. So I was really happy that my parents um, talked to the staff here and made the arrangements for me to return here to Fairfield High School. But they looked and looked for a sign language interpreter. My understanding is they looked, they interviewed, but they could not find a qualified sign language interpreter. There just weren't any. So they decided that they would provide me note takers. And they hired a woman that would sit beside me and she would take notes in all of my classes for ninth through 12th grade. So the first two years, it was Ann Buchan. She was my note taker. And then um, later it was Diane Schneider. But those notes, they really were a team um, when they brought me back and let me be a part of the um, Fairfield community with my friends that were in my neighborhood. Because then I was able to go to school, I knew who my friends were here. I'm very thankful for those note takers because those notes would be given to me. I would read them every night when I got home. Because at that time when I went to class, um, I had to do a lot of lip reading, which really is very hard to understand. But if a teacher would turn and write on the board and talk at the same time, I had no idea what the teacher was saying. So things like that would happen, and I missed a lot of information. The notes helped me a lot. Lip reading, um, I'd like to take the opportunity to explain a little bit because people think that lip reading for the deaf is, oh, <coughs> such an easy thing to do. It really is not. Actually, it, many people call it speech guessing, it's, or speech reading, but speech guessing, really. Um, it's the best way, they think that's the best way to access information and it really isn't because it's really speech guessing because you can only understand roughly 40% of what's being said and you guess the rest of it. Um, I'll give you an ex um, example of one thing that happened and how easy it is to um, assume you've got the information. Last night we were all at home um, and we were eating. We were having pizza with my dad, my husband, and my friend Cindy and her husband. We're all sitting around just talking. So I asked my dad, I said, hey, dad, what um, do they, are they serving tomorrow night at the tailgating party? What, what um, kind of food do we have? So my dad responded and he said, hot dogs. And I thought he said jelly. And I was like, jelly? My husband said, yeah, strawberry or grape jelly with your hot dog. I was like, what? That doesn't make any sense. So I looked at Sydney, and she was interpreting, and she spelled chili, not jelly. It was chili, but it looked like jelly on the mouth. And I knew it didn't make sense, but really, it's very hard. And there's also a fun game you guys ought to try. It's new. They just come out maybe a year or two ago and it's caught it's in a box and you put these headphones on and the game is called the hearing game so the point of the game is you try to guess what someone's saying on their lips you sit across from these people you're in teams you put on these headphones and they have white noise and you can't hear the person across from you has to tell you what's on the card I played that with some of my hearing friends and they always miss, but it's a, lot of, it's a lot of fun to try, figure out what they're trying to say. Anyway, um, I just wanted to take the opportunity to um, 
tell you what lip reading really looks like. school time, I am just very thankful for many things. I got a quality education here in Fairfield. I value that. It was very important. That set the tone for the rest of my life to keep going and give me a better future and a better life. I had teachers and administrators that genuinely cared about me. And I, they know who they are and I remember them. And also, I had friends and peers in my classes, and they liked me. They came up with me. Um, I saw a few of them today, but that wouldn't have happened back then. So I had friends and peers, and I appreciate that. And them trying to talk with me and trying to be my friends. I felt included. And then here, being a small town, everyone knew each other. There's a great benefit to that. You can't get away with anything. You're responsible for your actions, and it also was a safe environment. I knew I had an obligation to do well. So I'm just really thankful for those things when I look back at my time here at Fairfield High School. It was tough. It, it was tough, though, in high school. It was a real challenge. I already talked about the lip reading and missing information. That in itself, um, being deaf didn't bother me, but it did bother me when I didn't know what other people were saying. That, that was really hard when I was missing out or when I misunderstood. So I was really proud to graduate from uh, Fairfield High School because high school at that time, what, what other options were there for me? I could have gone to a Tumwa High School, but I really didn't want to. It, was too, it wasn't so much that it was so far, but it was a big high school. And so I was kind of, wasn't interested in that. Or my parents could have sent me to ISD, the Iowa School for the Deaf, which is in Council Bluffs. But that was so far away from home, and I would have to live there. And I'd probably only come home like once a month, and I didn't want that. Because high school, um, my mom was my best friend friend in high school, and I wasn't ready to leave that. Well, and you know, um, getting this award makes me think about different things that happened here when I was in high school. I was involved in lots of different activities. I don't remember everything, but I do remember I was involved with the newspaper. I was involved with the yearbook, the Quill yearbook. I was class treasurer, I was a part of the volleyball team, the basketball team, I was the manager, and we went to, um, it was a six on six game back then. It was a wonderful experience for me. Also, um, being involved with all of those activities was my way to um, Get to know people, make friends, because really I had to take the initiative to start the conversation sometime. And I'm very shy. That is not easy for me. I don't approach people well. I tend to be very quiet and wait for them to come to me. So, because I am quiet. But you have to find a way to make connections and to get involved. And that was my way to make those connections um, socially, was to get involved. After I graduated from Fairfield High School, I went to Central College in Pella, and I graduated with my BA in Psychology. That school experience was um, even more difficult than high school because um, it was the same type of things as what you have here in the high school. I had a note taker there. Um, Fairfield hired the note taker for me here, which was great. And she was there every day, gave me my notes and so forth, so I could read them, so I knew what the information was. There, um, it was voluntary for the students. You know, sometimes their notes weren't so great, but sometimes they didn't bother to give me the notes. So that made it even more of a challenge. And there was a lot more class discussions and people talking in groups and so forth. 
that was almost impossible for me to follow that conversation because when you're in a group, one person starts to talk, and by the time I realized who was talking and looked over there, I had missed quite a bit of what they'd already said. And then somebody else would start talking and try to keep up with it and figure out who was talking, what they were saying. So you only got just bits and pieces of what was saying. And sometimes you didn't even know who was talking. And those classroom discussions were very popular in high school or college when I was there. Now, I did make some arrangements with my professors um, to be sure that they would give me, when they tested me, they, only they didn't cover the discussion. It was only the reading information because there was no way I would know during the discussion if I had the right information or not. But I, thankfully, I was a very good reader. So that was really my way of getting through college. I'm proud then that, to have gone to Central College because when I was ready to go to college, I wrote to over 25 different colleges. And back at that time, um, I didn't know if they had services for the deaf and hard of hearing or not. Uh, every one of them, except for Central College and Pella, were willing to work with me. None of the others were. The others, they said, mm, we don't have the services. So that made my decision much easier, go to Central, because they were willing to use some accommodations for me. They gave me, uh, for my bedroom, my dorm room, uh, a flashing light if someone were to come to the door, or I had a TTY with a flashing light if, if the phone would ring. There were a lot of different accommodations that they gave me that helped me, and I really appreciated them um, taking the time to do that for me. Now today, under the ADA, they would be required, I mean, those universities um, get public funds to provide the accommodations for individuals that have disabilities, but that really wasn't an option back then for me. When I graduated from Central, I needed more education, I knew that, so I began thinking. I decided to go to Gallaudet University, which is in Washington, D.C. Now, at Gallaudet, it is the only deaf university in the world. I was by myself as I was growing up. I was deaf. I was always in a hearing environment. And I just knew there had to be more. There had to be more than just this. And I wanted to experience <coughs> deaf community. I wanted to experience sign language. So. I was accepted at Gallaudet. I was in their grad program. So I was there for three years. That was the, a great experience for me. One of the most important things that I learned from Gallaudet is that I, as a deaf person, really, as a human, really as a human, I have a full right to communication and understanding what's being said around. I, I don't need to miss that. And I didn't understand that before. I just under, I just accepted, well, I missed that, okay. I didn't understand what was said, all right, that's just the way it was. I just thought that's the way it had to be. But inside, I just knew, it didn't feel right. That's just not right. So at Gallaudet, I learned I had a right to know what was being spoken at all times and to have access to that. And that was a very good lesson for me. And that lesson I have brought back to the Des Moines Public Schools where I work because that's my life's goal, to work with deaf and hard of hearing children and to help them to have an open communication and accessibility that they, so they don't have to struggle with missing information like I did. I don't want them to have to experience that because life itself is tough. You have to be responsible. You have all these things you need to do in life to make things go, but then you add the deafness and communication barrier. If, if you take away the communication barriers and provide accessibility, then you can deal with um, life itself even though it's tough. It makes it a little bit easier. You all know I work for Des Moines. 
I also teach ASL and deaf culture classes at Drake University, those, um, two, those two particular classes. My goal in life is to be sure that we increase communication access for our deaf and hard of hearing, and hearing as well. Because it, the benefit from that is it's visual support. I'm very lucky in my employment that I'm able to develop many important relationships with many people that I work with, that work with students out there, and staff, and colleagues, and administrators. Relationships really are critical. The tone from Jess Omer, I have a quote from, Jess, from James Comer that says, there's no significant learning occurs without a significant relationship. So I think about you guys, all of your lives while you're in high school, right now, and on into the future. I hope that you have a significant relation with someone at school. Someone that inspires you and motivates you. It's really important because that is the key to unlocking the door and to learning. I really have three hopes for all of you here today. One was to let you know that it's important in my life and yours to be continually learning, be a lifelong learner. You may not go to college, that's okay, but you can still continue to learn. Don't stop, you are always a learner. Care about your uniqueness, embrace it. My uniqueness is my deafness. Actually, I consider my, de my deafness a gift from God because I don't feel um, I would uh, be where I am today. I'm proud to be deaf. Embr I'm proud that I sign and I can speak. I have my language ability, that I can communicate with different people. I'm, I'm proud that I can solve different communication situations. I also know that um, college, as a college grad program, the professor when I was there, I had to learn how to advocate for myself. Because as far as being deaf, people just don't always understand. You know, they, 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 sometimes they feel awkward. And you have to have the confidence in yourself to let people know what it is that you need. And you should do that. And value that uniqueness about yourself. And ask for what it is that you need. Don't be afraid to ask people. People are willing, they sometimes just don't know and you have to advocate. There may be many situations that are involved in professionally and personally that I've had to advocate for myself. Cindy shared one of those examples with you already. In that particular situation, it involved my first husband and the hospital. It was a terrible um, time. But it also, it happens to other deaf people too, and I don't want them to experience that again or that same thing. I want, them, I want to fight to open that up and have that communication access provided everywhere. to being deaf that sometimes people don't know about. One is you visually process the world. You see things differently because you take it in through your eyes and that gives you a different perspective that other people don't always have. So you get the opportunity to have that perspective and to share that. It makes life very interesting. So that's one of the gains. And then another one is you have a community that you are a part of. People that understand you and understand your experiences 
you have those relationships that you're a part of with people that um, support what it is and who you are as a person. And then thirdly, you have an identity. Um, one of the interesting comments, um, when I was doing my dissertation, I was interviewing a mother, um, a mother, a hearing mother, and her little girl was roughly about three. So I asked the mom, do you see any positive benefits to your daughter being deaf? And the mom said, well, yeah. And I said, well, what is that? She said, well, deaf people seem to know themselves. They know who they are. And I don't feel like I always know who I am. I found that very interesting, and she's right. A lot of deaf people will say they know who they are because of their life situations, and it has shaped who they are, the way they had to grow up, the way they had to adapt. Now, it isn't all about them, but it does define them. So finding that identity within them and knowing who they are and accepting that identity. That's really some people, um, a lot of people, many deaf are very proud to be deaf. So having that identity helps. And then fourthly, the things that help a deaf person, texting, it helps everybody else. Closed captioning, that helps everyone else. Everything that helps a deaf person pretty much helps everyone, and that's kind of a nice benefit to being deaf. The last benefit is you can travel anywhere in the world, and you don't have to be fearful or worried about communication access, because even though they speak a different language, you can, deaf people know how to use gestures, they can draw pictures, they can, um, visually show things to people. It, deaf people aren't afraid to travel anywhere. Um, they know it's okay, and they can figure out that communication. So I hope also that you learn and value and embrace your uniqueness and who you are, and that you advocate for yourself for what it is that you need. So in conclusion, I would like to say thank you to several different people. All of you here today that have allowed me to be here and to share my life experiences with you. My parents uh, for raising me to be who I am. My mom is sitting over here, my father's over here. My husband, his support, continuous support. I couldn't do this without him. My friend, Cindy Crawford, who's interpreting today. Plus, the presenters. We want to honor all of the presenters. I'm very proud and appreciative of that, that I'm one of the um, chosen. The people that nominated me for the Wall of Honor, I want to thank them too. The nomination committee for choosing me, for selecting me. The current um, high school administration for inviting us here today. Thank you, everyone, that has made today a possibility. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brecky. Ms. Sally Johnson will now introduce Ms. Johnny Parker. Good morning. It is indeed my honor and my privilege to be here this morning to introduce my dear friend, Johnny Parker. The guidelines for this award state that a nominee must be a graduate of FHS who has achieved distinction in profession, public, or community service and has had a positive influence on the lives of others. First of all, Johnny is indeed qualified for this honor. She is an honors graduate of FHS, a member of the fantastic class of 1966. <laughs> we're well represented today. If I were to list all of Johnny's professional achievements, we would be here all morning, and you would probably miss a few classes and maybe even lunch. But I'll just name a few. 
You don't have to agree with that. <laughs> John Dean received her Bachelor of Science in Nursing from Northeast Missouri State University in 1970. She served her fantastic nursing career at the Jefferson County Health Center, which at the time she began was Jefferson County Hospital. She served from 1972 till her retirement in 2015. She rose to the position of Vice President of Clinical Services in 2008. Most importantly for most of us, and this is most of many, she was instrumental in initiating and promoting the idea of a new hospital Jefferson County, and in planning and designing the new Jefferson County Health Center. After her retirement, she was immediately named to the Jefferson County Health Center Board of Directors. She continues to serve there and serves as the current president of the Health Center Foundation Board of Trustees. You can see she's a very busy lady. Also in her profession, she was named an American Cancer Society Nurse of Hope in 1972, 82, pardon me, an Iowa Hospital Association Outstanding Nurse Leader in 2003, and one of 100 great nurses in Iowa in 2007. And there are many, many more. Johnny's public and community services are just as numerous. Allow me to name just a few. She is the current president of the Fairfield Area Chamber of Commerce. She is a past president of the Greater Jefferson County Foundation. She has served her native community as the past president of the Libertyville Community Betterment Committee and the Libertyville Community Housing Committee. She is indeed a Libertyville girl. And she was a founding member of the Fairfield Arts and Convention Center Board. Again, many, many more. Johnine has been honored for her lifetime of service. In 2000, she, was, she received the Fairfield Area Chamber of Commerce Outstanding Citizen Community Service Award. That means Citizen of the Year. Yes, Johnine has most definitely had, and continues to have, and will always have, a positive influence in the lives of others. In addition to the many roles she has filled in her vocation, she has impacted our community and our state by her willingness to present programs on a variety of health matters to many organizations and to share her knowledge and her expertise with her colleagues, her friends, and her neighbors. As is obvious, she gives willingly of her time and talents to many community organizations and activities. Deb Carden, who at one time was Johnny's colleague, has stated, Janine has led a life of service to others and is the very personification of the word caring. This is true not just in her professional life, but in the countless personal relationships she nurtures. She constantly thinks of hundreds of ways to make the lives of others easier and happier. Her daughter Janice has stated, Mom has done all this while heading up the family and continuing to be a huge presence in our lives, as she always has been. Johnny never hesitates to put others first and to enrich the lives of others with encouragement and positive reinforcement. She most certainly has that positive influence in the lives of others. Please welcome my friend, Johnny Parker. someplace and wondering, who are they talking about? That's kind of how that was. I am so grateful and so honored to be here, and I humbly look out at you as this uh, great honor has been bestowed upon me, and don't really know quite how that happened, I guess. I'm looking at an auditorium packed with stars, and some of you know you are, but some of you don't know it quite yet. I'd like to start and tell you a little bit about me and how I grew up. I am a Libertyville girl. Any Libertyville people out there? Come on. That's good. We like to see that. 
when I went to Libertyville School, or when I grew up there, it was K through 12, it was a small community school, but it had some fantastic teachers. And it was a place to go that was an eye-opening, smile-making place because it was an opportunity to learn, even with some of the harsh disciplinarians we had who tried to control those of us from Libertyville. Um, I decided early on that I would not mention a lot of different people because I would surely leave somebody out. But they were there, and they were there for me. My early life had some tough times. Seven of us resided in a, a small three-room home. We were very poor, and it was very embarrassing to try to talk to the grocer or to the dentist or whomever about how we would try to scrape together 50 cents a week to pay for our services or our bills. And I'm telling you this because I know you I am sitting out there in some of those seats, and I want you to know. We got church boxes of clothes, and we were delighted to get them because it meant something new to wear. Even if it wasn't quite right or the right fit or whatever, it was clothing for us. On top of that, my, uh, my appearance was different. This was a time before sunscreens, and so my family, my siblings, and I would get very dark in the summertime. And there were people in conservative Libertyville who thought we were too different and would not allow me to play with their children or to even step on their lawns. You add to that then, too, my family owned a tavern, Smith's Tavern at Libertyville, which is now Peck's Pub, some of you know. Um, again, a very conservative town, and I remember so well sitting in church and junior choir one day and having the minister speak and preach openly against my father using his name. And I was too embarrassed and too weak to get up and leave that assemblage. And I was overweight. Oh, me and the calorie, let me tell you. We have been friend and foe my entire life, my entire life. When I was nine years old, my dad died. That left us five children and mom. Mom knew she would have to go to work at least two jobs just to try to feed us and keep us together. My older sister Jan and my mentor was, had left nursing school to come home to take care of dad during his last time. And our mother, staunch and determined she was, insisted that she go back to school. And she did. That left me to be mother to the six, four, and six month year old people while mom was gone. And I apologize right now because I didn't know a whole lot about it right then. And I'm not sure I picked up a lot along the way, but they're good people. They're great, great people. My mom was a feisty, gritty, independent woman. She meant to keep our family together. And we were a family. And we fought like a family. But we stood up for each other, too. We were lucky because there were many families in Libertyville that were in the same boat. And there were good people. And I started the list. And it just, it just couldn't happen because there were so many good people who thought we were OK. We could play with their children. We could make friends, and I do say friends, good friends. I can't emphasize that enough to all of you. Make the right choices in your friends and hold them dear and hold them close because they are everything in life. They really are, they carry you through. And we learned a work ethic early on. We had to work. It was the only way that we could get by. And you know what? I knew I was going to succeed. Then came along junior high, and guess what? We integrated with Fairfield. Well, I told you about what I was coming into this environment. And we didn't call it bullying then. It was just that we were very different. It was tough on us country kids coming into Fairfield. The Fairfield kids knew each other. We were brand new. And I remember the day that we came on the bus, our superintendent said, now remember, you're going to be looked upon as hicks from the sticks. Remember, you're good people. Remember that. So. Anyway, we worked at things. There were more good teachers. There were exciting things happening in this town of Fairfield, which we didn't get to very often because getting out of Dodge, being Libertyville, didn't happen very much. I once tried to dig to China because I thought it was a way out of town. And I found this piece of old rusty metal. And I thought, man, this is probably from the Silver War because I didn't know that wasn't really the Silver War. But uh, when neighbor's dad fell in it, that didn't go over well. So I quit digging to China and just waited for chances to get out of town. So on to high school. 
Opportunities. Oh my goodness, opportunities here. Incredible opportunities, chances to learn. More new friends who'd been acquired in middle school, which it is now, but junior high for us, and then more new friends in high school. And an education. Wow, an education. You know, in your life, sometimes you have to look at what you don't want to do to get a good vision of what you do want to do as you're moving along. Excellent college prep. Oh my goodness, if I could tell you, and I know there are folks here in the audience today who are near and dear some, to some of the teachers I would name, who made sure that we learned what we needed to know to go on to college, and it made college much easier. Activities. There were activities when you could get away to do them. There was music. There were things going on, you know, things that could touch your soul, just like it could touch your vocal cords. And you know you can't take the past with you your whole life. You start dropping those things and recognize that you can be a person in your own right. Of your own right. It's okay. It's good. And look with optimism on your future. Because that's where we want to reside. With optimism for sure. FHS prepared me and I was ready. A wonderful, wonderful woman here said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to be a nurse. And she said, I think we can make that happen. And it wasn't until years later that I realized I didn't choose to be a nurse. A greater power directed me to nursing and made it my life's passion and made it something that would give back to me hundreds fold over my lifetime. Now school and life taught me a lot of lessons and I want to tell you that I'm still learning. Life's about choices. We choose to try rather than giving up. Now, when you were a baby and you stood up to take that first faltering step and you sat down on your bones, guess what? You got right back up. You tried again because I saw you walking in here today. I know you did. I know you can do it. If we carry that through our whole life to try and try again, what a great world this would be for everybody. We choose to understand. We choose to understand people, people who are different than we are, who are different in cultures, in diversities. We choose that, and when you choose to do that, your life is enriched. We choose to change rather than trying to change uh, other people. We choose to change, and you can impact bad situations or, or lots of different things in our lives. We'll never change other people unless they want to change. We're, we're in charge of us, just us. We can change us. And choosing to recognize, and this one came along, was kind of long and drawn out, that problems are just opportunities to make things better. Maybe you can't impact the whole thing, but if you can impact part of it, or you can do the whole thing, do it. Chip away at it. Opportunities. Not just problems. They're not in our way. What can I do to change this around for me to make it better for others? I learned that every human being has is unique and has worth and value. And that included me. My sister Jeannie says, be you. All the rest are taken. Then it makes sense, doesn't it? Look for those qualities in people and be nice. Treat everybody with respect and care and compassion and you've already heard that today. You be the one that makes eye contact and reaches out and says hello or whatever. You be the one to include people because you don't know what other people are going through. Bullying, ridiculing, belittling people will always make you the loser. And you know what? Someday, you might need help. There might be a plea from you, and guess what? One of those people might be the one there. And do you know what else? They'll give it freely and willingly to you because they walk the walk, and they know what that feels like. And when life is all done, at the end, and I certainly have been part of the beginning of life and part of the end in many situations, it's not anything about what you have, your possessions, your things. It is all about people. It is all about folks and those people who are in your life. And it's not so much what you say or what you do with people. It's how you make them feel that's going to matter. 
that's going to really matter and that's going to really set you apart. I learned to never assume. I challenge you to look down at your shoes. Nobody walks in them but you. And guess what? You don't walk in anybody else's because you don't know what's behind all those people. You don't know what's making up their, their history or their thoughts. I've learned to respect ethics, for sure, and I'm hoping that you've seen ethics and work in this school, in your community, in your churches, in your families. You'll never justify giving yours away. Remember that. Take your lumps now. Own up to your mistakes. It may be rough for a time, but it's going to shape you and make you a better person in the end. And please understand that everything that is wrong in your life and that just isn't going right is not somebody else's fault. You are a company called you, and you are the CEO of that company. Makes you pretty darn special. I've learned that if it's too good to be true, it isn't true, for sure. Many prey on others, and I would challenge you not to be a predator. But don't be a sucker either. Look for the good in everybody and everything. If you're looking for the bad, you're probably going to find it. But tell me what good that's going to do you. And what you do and I do matters, whether it's coming to school, whether it's grades, whether it's involvement, whether it's your record, your social media posts, your reputation. And remember, it's a lot easier to keep a good reputation than it is to try to repair a bad one. That's an uphill battle. Everyone else is doing it, just doesn't cut it. And then there's the value of giving back. That's something that I would want each of you to think seriously about. Many of you, many of you have already been given back to from your life itself. You've been given life, a precious gift. To your families, to your fabulous teachers here, to those fighting for your freedom and our American way of life, to maybe someone who's given a lifelong gift of money so that you can have a scholarship to further your education. At the toughest and lowest times in my life, my salvation has always been reaching out and giving back to others. It allows me to step outside of myself and whatever cesspool it feels like right at the time. Give back, be a volunteer. Don't be a taker, be a giver. And understand success. You know, we're kind of skewed in America about success. Success is not linked to a job title. It takes every job to make every organization work, every single job. And as long as you do the best job of the job you have, you're a success. Be passionate about it, too, because that has its own rewards and add other passionate things. And then surround yourself with good people. I have a family, a fabulous family. Mine's the best, and I want to thank you for being here. You know, I realize you can't choose your family, but you can choose your legacy. And sometimes it might even include choosing a different family, but that's okay too. You make the choices that are right for you. Choose your mate if you choose to have one. And I have the best. Gene's amazing, and he is so supportive. And then there are my children. I can't look at them because I've got to hold this together for about another minute or so. They're all FHS graduates, including my extended children, who are here today too, who are grads, from this school. And like so many, have gone on to make wonderful impacts in life. I'm so proud of them. My professional colleagues over my career, and you know who you are, and there's a special one here today, I know, who helped me to live my work with passion, allowed me to learn. They were mentors. They lifted me up. There was so much out there, and they're out there for all of you, those people, those same kind of people, and then good friends. What blessings. I have been so supremely blessed with friendships, and I look around here today, and I'm so thankful to see many faces that, that have uh, been there to support me, who lifted me up, who helped me have a good time. Uh, I'm here today because of all of the people in my life. I challenge you, too, to recognize who real heroes are. A hero is not necessarily someone who makes a lot of money and is the top in beauty or sports or talent, or someone 
who enjoys life at the expense of others. A hero is that person that goes to work every day and comes home, and even though they're tired, they spend time with their family, or they coach a team, or they uh, uh, lead a youth group, or they volunteer in some other way. A hero is an educator, and believe me, you have them here. Thank you, thank you, all of you educators who work countless hours to provide opportunities and resources and feedback to all of you students who are here. Heroes are students like you who come here every day, who are involved, who are involved whether you sit on the bench or whether you're on the athletic floor or field or whatever, who also volunteer, who help at home, people who serve on boards and committees. Heroes are common people with uncommon valor. I've been richly blessed with heroes in my life. I've been richly blessed with mentors. And I challenge you to figure out who those real heroes are and recognize them and let them know your gratitude that they're in your life. And then humor, it lightens the load and it keeps life so interesting. I would challenge each of you to live each day of your life in ways that you want to be remembered. You can do whatever you want in life. Who says you can? And what do they know? Who says? A very, very special man who was my godfather once said, no matter what you do in life, you're going to make people happy. If you fall flat on your face and you make a mess of something, there are going to, people, going to be people who say, I always knew she was going to do that. They're going to be happy. And then there are going to be those who embrace your successes and who are there for you and are happy because they knew you could do it. Who says you can't, even from small town Iowa, do whatever you want? You go for it. You're in charge of you. You can choose for you. Again, it is with so much gratitude and thankfulness that I recognize all these components in my life over such a very long time. My life has been filled with good things, and I recognize that, and I'm thankful for that each and every day. I'm richly and abundantly blessed. And today, I extend that thanks to even a different sector in allowing me this great honor. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Parker. At this time, we will have music by the FHS Box Choir in the direction of Mr. Zach Ryder.
Thank you, Mr. Ryder. Outstanding performance as per always from the box choir. Well done. So I do, I do have a few closing remarks as uh, we get ready to uh, go to class. Uh, I, I really want to compliment the student body once again. Um, I'm always so proud of you. Um, you do amazing things and you sit here and uh, I believe you took the opportunity to maybe get 1% better from the knowledge that was shared by our new members. So give uh, the student body a hand if you would. I would also like to thank the uh, new members of the Wall of Honor uh, as each and every one of them provided us with a great message. And uh, even if you know Mr. Hunter Dose mentioned you catch just a little piece of what they're sharing with you, uh, you're hopefully going to be better as you walk out than when you walked in. So if we could give the Wall of Honor another wonderful round of applause.